those like what to come. It was one of the most notorious events of its time and British people were very keen to see the place where their princess had been attacked and so they added it to their itineraries. The king and queen were lucky to escape with their lives, but Matteo Morral shot himself rather than face arrest. Today, over a hundred years later, this tragic assassination attempt is still remembered locally. Yeah. Hola, buenos días. Buenos días. Esa foto? That, what, what's that photograph of? Yeah, that photo is authentic. It's an authentic photograph. It was taken just after it happened. So there's a dead horse here. There's a carriage here that must have been part of the royal procession. And there's a little X that marks the window from which the bomb was thrown. I remember the victims of the 31 de mayo with a corona all those years. No me digas. Yes. The viernes que viene pasa una corona ahí, el recuerdo de las víctimas. He's saying that uh, every year he goes out and he puts a bouquet on there in memory of the 25 people who were killed and the many who were injured. Desde cuando lo hace? How long have you been doing that? Desde que se inauguró ese monumento. Que lo inauguré yo porque no venía nadie a inaugurarlo y cogí una escoba, levanté la bandera de España y así se inauguró ese monumento. He says he'd been doing it ever since the uh, monument was open, and he had to open the monument himself. He says no one, no one was coming along to do a ceremony, so he went out there with a broom and a Spanish flag, and he performed an opening ceremony on the monument. Pues qué bueno. Pues encantado de conocerlo. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Having made their royal pilgrimage, Bradshaw's traveller's spirits could have been lifted by the crowds and the noisy chatter of one of the city's most popular meeting places. Mm. This is the lovely Puerta del Sol at the very heart of Madrid. Bradshaw's tells me that the cafes in and around here may be used without question during the day, but at night are not suitable for ladies, especially those cafes where music is provided in the evening. Luckily, I'm male, and this is the midday sun, so I should be safe. But one tip, in Madrid, always look up. The architecture is wonderful, particularly these balconies with that marvellous wrought iron work, so typical of Spain. defy any traveller, Edwardian or otherwise, not to fall in love with Spain's tapas. These small snacks originated from Andalusia in the 19th century to accompany sherry. Traditional dishes range from olives, meats and cheese to these croquettes. Very, very nice. They, um, they've got cod and flour and a little butter, um, milk a bit of nutmeg, and then breadcrumbs and egg on the outside, and then they're deep fried, and they're lovely. Gracias. Despite being the most reluctant European country to join the railway age, Spain proved very much a magnet for Bradshaw's 1913 railway tourists. One of the biggest draws would have been Madrid's stunning royal art collection. Any young artist who came to the Prado Art Gallery around the beginning of the 20th century would have studied Diego Velázquez, the greatest genius of Spanish painting history. Mm. A man who made his fame and fortune with religious paintings and portraits of the royal family, but whose real greatness lay in the way that he captured light and the way that he portrayed ordinary people, workers, drunks, the lowest rungs of society. Velázquez was at the height of his powers in the 17th century. Early 20th century travellers might have been more drawn to one of their era's most brilliant artists, who was also a devotee of Velázquez. I'm heading to his studio. This grand mansion was formerly the home of Joaquín Sorolla, and has changed little since he died in 1923. It now houses his works. I'm meeting the director of the museum, Consuelo Luca de Tena. He lived here for the last 10 or more years of 
his life. He had this house specially built for him. It's absolutely magnificent. I recognize these yes, people. Yes, of course. This is Victoria Eugenia. Victoria, isn't it? yes. And this the King Alfonso the Thirteenth. The King must be a friend of Sorolla. Yes. And this says to Don Joaquin Sorolla, I'm supposing that you're going to like the contrast of the light in this photograph. <laughs> it's quite a nice little joke, isn't it? Sorolla paint, uh, portrayed uh, the king in the open air. The king is uh, covered with s spots of light that comes through the trees. And it's very special. Born in Valencia, Sorolla used the train to travel back to the coastal city to paint some of his finest oh. work. This is a huge room. I, I imagine, with all the light here, this would be where the artist was painting. Yes. We have so many paintings that show how Sorolla depicted light. I mean, here, for example, these, these ladies on the beach, the intensity of the light on their clothing and reflecting off the sea. This is quite typical. Very typical. Soroya was very fond of uh, painting uh, the beach, the light in the open air, and particularly the light reflecting itself in the, in the waters. In complete contrast is this poignant picture painted in 1895 called The White Slave Trade. A group of young women traveling in a third-class railway carriage is being taken to the city to work as prostitutes. So did Sorolla paint a lot of this kind of social realism? Not so many paintings. Um, he disliked the insistence of some artists and writers of his time on the on the poor social conditions of Spain in that, in that moment. He was a very optimistic man and very positive and thought that it was better to find the wood part of the things. How do you think we should remember Joaquin Sorolla? I think his paintings uh, many times <laughs> make us happy. He is very contagious in his optimistic feelings. Sorolla has left us a wonderful vision of early 20th century Spain even if most of his scenes are rose-tinted. Across the city, in the Retiro district of Madrid, is another building with royal... When guests arrived in 1906 for Alfonso and Eugenie's wedding, they discovered that they'd nowhere suitable to stay. Afterwards,
<laughs> no time to get used to this royal luxury, as today I'm heading southwest out of Madrid. Early 20th century visitors from Britain to the high central plain of Spain would have found their fair share of strange noises and smells. But at least Madrid, with its royal family and its works of art, was familiar enough. Those visitors might have needed a fortifying breakfast of omelette and ham and cheese before venturing south over the mountains to somewhere altogether more exotic with its Islamic history, its gypsies, its bullfighting, its crimes of passion and other thoroughly un-British activities. I'm taking Spain's high-speed train from Madrid, the Ave, and traveling about 400 kilometers to Cordoba. Bradshaw's has warnings for the British traveler. First-class carriages are tolerably comfortable. Second-class carriages are wanting in comfort. Third-class carriages are unsuitable for British travellers. Railway speed is slow, rarely more than 15 miles per hour. Well, since today there is a club class and a preferential class, and I'm in tourist class, you could say that I'm in third, but now the speed is more like 170 miles an hour on the high-speed trains that were introduced in Spain more than 20 years ago. But I remember the really slow Spanish trains. When I was eight, I traveled to meet my Spanish family and the trains felt not a lot faster than in Bradshaw's day. The seats were wooden and extremely uncomfortable but it was exciting. Hello. Hello, how are you? Do you mind if I join you for a moment? Yeah, it's a pleasure. How do you do? Do you regularly use this train? I regularly use this train, yes. To go to Sevilla or to Barcelona. There's a big, big difference with the, with the best. Yeah. How is it that Spain has made such a big change? Well, I think it is that generation who has uh, started after the uh, Franco's uh, death, I think the transition, political transition, has created a common ground to grow together. Mm. Well, my uh, guidebook from 1913 mm -hmm. tells me that third class is not suitable for British travellers. Uh, <laughs> do, do you think this is suitable for British travellers? I think so. I am a chairman of a company in Spain uh, with 6,000 people working. And precisely today we go to our shareholder meeting. Hmm. And we all, the board, we are in tourist. You're going to tourist class. Because we are in times that we need to save money. Yeah. And secondly, I'm not seeing any difference between yeah. first, second, and tourist. Traveling at this speed, in an hour and a half, we go to a different climate to different people with a different take on life. We swap the austerity of Castile for the exuberance of Andalusia. People who bear the influences of centuries of Islamic rule during the Middle Ages and of gypsy culture. And in their singing, their dancing, and their bullfighting, they're fired by an inner spirit known as Duende, which drives them to poetry and passion. Cordoba's period of greatest glory began in the 8th century after the Moorish conquest. With 300 mosques, it became the greatest Islamic center in the Western world. Ever since Roman times, it's had a unique position as the crossroads of Spain because of its bridge. Situated on the mighty Guadalquivir River, Jews from the east and Arabs from the south were funneled through the city by this natural geographical divide. I find this really very moving. I am. Um...